Hello, everybody. I didn't want to talk about the election today, since that's a little bit old news. I wanted to cover a topic that I have covered before quite a bit uh, that I think is a pretty interesting one, and that is anarcho-syndicalism uh, or anarcho-communism or anarcho-socialism. And I now realize that uh, each of those terms has you know, slightly different meanings. Um, I think it's fair to group them together, if not necessarily uh, lump them together and assume that they're all similes. Uh, but this is, you know, one of the areas where there's actually a lot of substantive debate. Uh, it's so hard when we're talking about contemporary politics to really uh, isolate principles and and have uh, consistent rhetoric. I mean, both parties, Democrats and Republicans, whether we're talking Hillary Clinton or or Donald Trump, have rhetoric that is always mixed. Uh, that's always a, uh, an inconsistent hodgepodge of things. And of course, that makes it kind of tricky to come to a, a really strong position in terms of picking one or the other. Usually, uh, in this particular election, I felt that there was a strongly preferable candidate. But even so, it's not one that you can make without many qualifications. Um, Anarcho-syndicalists, on the other hand, uh, tend to be much more ideologically pure. It doesn't say that I agree with them, but that there's at least a chance for an intellectually honest, consistent debate. And I've done this in the past, and if you go back three or four years, I have lots of videos that uh, deal with different aspects of anarcho-syndicalism. Uh, and, you know, it is a fascinating topic. Now, uh, what I wanted to do now is discuss a book that I recently read, which kind of comes at it indirectly. Um, in, the, in the course of the debates with anarcho-syndicalists, um, reference to historical examples of anarcho-syndicalism uh, often become pertinent. And of course, there's debate always as what counts as a historical example and what does not. Uh, with anarcho-syndicalists, I think you're mostly dealing with a couple of 19th century examples in America, say like the New, the new, new Hope or New, new Harmony, uh, you know, these religious utopian societies that were kind of in vogue in the United States. And you had several of them, quite a few actually, you know, usually they wouldn't last too long. A few of them lasted a little bit longer. You have anarcho-syndicalist Spain. And then the most common one that I've heard uh, for a long time is the, kibitz, the kibitzum in Israel. And, you know, I think that my introduction to the kibbutz is from these debates with anarcho-syndicalists. I don't think that they were uh, an organization or... Uh, uh, a movement that I was aware of outside of these debates. And it wasn't one that I looked at uh, directly for many years. Um, there's something deeply unsatisfying with going online and just looking up a name and then finding an article about it because then you realize, especially one that's dealing with uh, debating, you know, libertarianism versus socialism. So I'm sure there are articles on Mises or on Fee or somewhere about the kibbutz. Brian Kaplan, I know, has written stuff about anarcho-syndicalist Spain, which isn't to say that those articles are wrong or fallacious or lies or anything like that, but they come from a very biased perspective. And the, who knows what they omit? Who knows? You know, it, it's very difficult to get an honest assessment of an institution. And I don't say honest in the sense that, uh, of disingenuous, uh, malicious deceit. But there's a whole story there, and to only look at something from the, is it libertarian, is it not libertarian, is it capitalist, is it not capitalist, does it work optimally according to Austro, Austrian economics or whatever, looking at an institution like that or a city or a country and failing to take in like its entire context, you know, is a very limited way to learn about something. Now, I wasn't super interested in the kibbutz. Um, but at some point in the last couple of years, I was watching a documentary about Israel. I don't remember what it was. Chances are it was related to Max, Max Blumenthal. I read his book uh, about uh, living in the greater Israel. And in the course of that documentary, they interviewed many people. And they interviewed this one gentleman several times who it just kind of blurbed that he had written a book about the kibbutz. And this is it. Kibbutz, Awakening from Utopia by Daniel Gavron. And what's 
good about this book, other than its brevity, it's not particularly long, uh, is that it's not coming from the perspective of a capitalist or a right winger or a libertarian. And it's not coming at it from the perspective of attempting to debunk the kibbutz or prove that they don't work or anything like that. This is a man who was very sympathetic to the kibbutz. He lived in a kibbutz and he is simply looking at the movement as it is today. And I think this book was published less than 10 years ago, maybe around uh, 2010, 2011. Uh, and there's been a great decline in the kibbutzim and he wants to analyze why um, along with giving history about it so for those of you who are completely unfamiliar you you have the zionist movement that uh, began late in the 19th century and you had a lot of uh, jews in europe especially and a few in other places who were debating uh, you know what jews should do and there were people who at different times advocated that they just convert to Catholicism or that they move to Madagascar or that they just assimilate completely. Uh, but eventually this popular idea came of moving uh, and creating a state and all the reasons why people think that they need a state were articulated many times over. Um, and uh, eventually uh, many of them settled on the idea of moving to Palestine. And during the course, which in the 19th century was part of the Ottoman Empire, during the course of World War One, the British apparently, uh, we don't know the full details of this, I don't think, in an attempt to garner support for their war effort against the Ottoman Empire, uh, produced what's called the Belfort Declaration, where they basically stated their preference that there be a Jewish homeland in Palestine and the Levant. Um, and I think that event was very important in that it really crystallized, you know, people probably stopped talking about going to Madagascar or uh, Algeria or who knows wherever else. Uh, and the idea of moving to Palestine, it, it already happened. There were people who had moved previously to this, uh, but that declaration and especially the uh, awarding of the Levant to Great Britain as part of its mandate after the World War I, uh, really set in motion a, a mass uh, immigra a mass immigration of, of Jews to to uh, Palestine and a huge number of these Jews are coming from uh, Eastern Europe you know what is uh, or, or Russia uh, or at, in the time at the time uh, the, the area becoming the USSR Poland Ukraine uh, and a lot of these people were extremely dyed-in-the-wool uh, leftist Marxists uh, maybe Leninists uh, and just utterly uh, immersed in the rhetoric and the ideology and the um, education of the left and they were many of them deeply swayed by anarcho-syndicalist anarcho-socialist principles and so when many of these people moved to Israel not all of them by any means, by any stretch, but many of them decided that they wanted to establish private propertyless communes, these areas where everyone would be equal and there'd be no capitalists and there'd be, we'd all, they'd all work on the land or in the factory together. Uh, everything would be based on voting. And uh, when you read the book, uh, very clearly the Marxist uh, prescription that uh, from each according to his ability to each according to his need was a guiding principle in uh, almost all of these kibbutzim and many of them were established um, several hundred eventually and uh, they existed in Israel uh, and they still exist to this day although they've de declined enormously in numbers um, and you know they're not all identical they weren't uh, all organized uh, from top down by you know a kibbutzim organization that uh, mandated how they be, how they be founded, they were founded by numerous individuals coming together to form them. Uh, although they, these individuals were united in their ideology more or less. Now there were some variations. You had some kibbutzim that were more explicitly religious, where you had others that were more explicitly atheistic. You had some that were more wedded to the idea of agriculture, whereas some were more wedded to the idea of being factory workers. And you even had a few that became urban um, and whatnot. So 
what this book was really valuable in that it, it is just an account of one of these classic examples uh, of an anarcho-syndicalist society. Now you can always, you know, the real world is not a science experiment and there's always details you can nitpick and say, wait, this isn't the perfect example. You know, in, the ca in this case, you could say, well, this environment is a hostile environment. It's not a good example because there's violence directed at the, at the kibbutzim and at the Jews uh, by Arabs. Uh, and, you know, the fact that the state of Israel and even before the state of Israel, the, the Zionist settlers and the kibbutzim in particular seemed quite capable in most cases of effectively defending themselves even pointing that out, you can still always say, well, it's not ideal. The entire society was not kibbutzim related, either before the establishment or after the establishment of the state of Israel. Right? So you can always say, well, you have these little islands of anarcho-syndicalism, but they are islands of anarcho-syndicalism. They're surrounded by a sea of whatever other zeitgeist you want to characterize Israel. Now, up until I mean, even today, Israel is a considerably more left-wing society than is the United States. Um, but up until the rise of the Likud party and some of the other right-wing parties in the 70s, it was a considerably more left-wing society than it is now. Um, and overtly Marxist and socialist in much of its rhetoric and actions. Uh, and the state of Israel has and this includes today, in many ways, subsidize the kibbutzim. Now, in terms of argumentation, if anything, that is a way to say, well, then they should do even better as a result of that. But you can always say it's not a pure enough example if unless everybody in Israel was a kibbutzim or everyone in the world was a kibbutzim. So as, but that's just to say that this is not a perfect example that you can never have a perfectly illustrative empirical test that proves one way or another. And I just, you know, and people who in the context of debate will like to bring that up. But the point is that can never happen. There will never be not just for kibbutzim or anarcho syndicalism, but for statism or libertarianism or anarcho capitalism or feudalism or fascism or communism or whatever else human society cannot be studied in the laboratory uh, conditions that would be required to isolate variables uh, and and reach definitive conclusions on the empirical evidence alone anyway. I think we can reach very strong conclusions when we wed what we observe empirically with theoretical considerations and ideological considerations, but not just by looking at what's going on there, you know, we and uh, so I think that this is a perfectly valid, you know, approach to take and to look, um, and a very fair one because this is again this book is not by Walter Block or Murray Rothbard or Ron Paul or somebody who would have an at the very least an ideological axe to grind. This is from somebody who is very sympathetic. When you read the book, uh, when the ideology of the author shines through, which it does in a couple of occasions. It's clear that he is not a free market capitalist, that he's not even f familiar with free market capitalism as an ideology in the sense that he understands it. Uh, he, in fact, his references to it are almost always derogatory uh, and show a lack of uh, awareness of it. So again, this is, this is as sympathetic as, as you can get. Now, I think why this is uh, good is because in all these debates, that not only that I've had, but anyone who's ever had uh, with anarcho syndicalists, you know, certain certain issues are always brought up, and and one that just probably the most commonly brought up one and the most pertinent one is the incentive problem, the idea that if everyone uh, is getting paid the same, so to speak, or if there's no wages, or or people are paid according to their need and not according to, uh, you know, their inputs, uh, that that's a recipe to incentivize sloth and laziness. Uh, if you're going to be subsidized no matter what, then why work? Why and Or if you do work, why work very hard? What's the point in putting forward extra effort if you receive nothing in return? Uh, and one thing that's made abundantly clear in this book is that that's a very real problem. 
uh, that you every kibbutzim has cadres of lazy people in them, and lazy being a relative term. Uh, now, interestingly enough, I think all of them had mechanisms by which they could remove people from the kibbutzim who they felt were doing nothing. Uh, but then, if that's the case, then the rhetoric of you're going to get taken get taken care of regardless is false then, right? It's not uh, this goods and services that are offered by the kibbutz or by the commune are not um, uh, unconditional services. And this is a big problem uh, when they debate capitalism because they say, well, sure, you have a job and sure, you're getting paid and it's nice that you have an income, but really that income is tainted because it's conditional. The only reason your boss is paying you, the only reason your employer is giving you uh, remuneration is because of the condition that you work for them as a slave, if you want to put it in a pejorative sense. But in these anarcho-communist societies as well, yes, you will get things given to you, but it's on the condition that you work and also that you work hard enough to keep them satisfied. And the the principal difference is very hard to parse out in that situation. It is wrong to say that an anarcho syndicalist society will simply give you whatever it is that you need completely independent. Like if you just did nothing, like I'm in the kibbutz, but I'm just going to stay in bed. I'm just going to, you know, uh, practice my music or play video games or whatever else. I'm not going to work in the factory. I'm not going to do any of that. Uh, but, you know, this is what I like to have for breakfast. Thank you. Uh, that would obviously not work and so it's not allowed and so like yes you will receive goods and service goods and services or you will receive uh, remuneration and some of the most of the kibbutzin uh your remuneration is in kind you are working at the factory or the farm and the products of the kibbutz and whatever their whether their produce or technological goods are then sold on the market which is another problem we'll get to in a minute um the revenues from those are then used to provide services to the members. So food, health care, you know, maybe other amenities like a pool or a gym uh, or a movie theater, uh, education for children, common one. Uh, but that you wouldn't actually get a salary. You wouldn't have an income. You would have no disposable income to use for your own. Oh, if I'd like to have a painting or a fish tank. Uh, or um, extra clothing or or a new pair. These were things that, and this is to go off the general uh, standard kibbutzim. There was there is of course variation within how they how they've done things. Um, so yeah, you're not getting paid money. You're getting paid in kind. You're getting paid in, in services and goods. But to, if you did nothing, they wouldn't pay and they would kick you out. Uh, the other thing is they. Uh, would even before you could join usually most of them have at least a year sometimes longer where you have to live there and work and basically buy in uh, before they uh, permit you to join and they vote and usually it's a pretty high majority that has to select you to, to enter so they are vetting at the outset people who they think are quality enough that they're going to earn their keep um, and well that's fine and I guess there's a lot about the kibbutzim that as a libertarian you know, we're not going to dispute, you know, if they want to do this voluntarily, it's fine. They have every right to do it. Um, you know, at no point when I read this book that I think, geez, these things should be outlawed. Um, but the idea then that all society should be organized along this way and, and what is implied by the term should, as in, well, you just think that would be preferable or you would actually uh, coerce people into joining them. Because it appears that their membership has to be kept somewhat selective for it to even begin to work. If this system attempted to incorporate everyone, uh, you know, then you don't have a situation where you can say, hey, that person's too lazy. We can't allow them in. If you have to allow everybody in to one kibbutzim or another, then you're going to have a whole bunch that are stuck with the people who are least likely to work or do the least quality work or the least amount of effort or whatever else. Or, you know, even other considerations, maybe they are a hard worker, maybe they are an intelligent worker, 
but maybe they cause enormous uh, interpersonal strife for whatever reason uh, to the point where they can break down how uh, the kibbutzim operates. What do you do, you know, with those people in in a system that has some anarcho syndicalism, but then a greater society outside of it where the people who don't quite mesh with that can go versus a society where everything is anarcho syndicalist, then there isn't an option unless we're going to talk about eradicating these people, which I'm not saying are anarcho syndicalists at least explicitly advocate, but it does seem like, well, what what's the what is the alternative that they would have to then go and form a society of outcast people who didn't make the cut to join the anarcho-syndicalist uh, freehold? Uh, so it's very clear that the the libertarian or free market critique of of incentives uh, and 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 whatnot uh, is a real problem. Even among the selected groups that are in the kibbutzim, you have a lot of people who don't work very hard, but they still go and get their medical care. They still go and get their their food. Uh, and they talk about how, uh, and this goes into both that and then the allocation of resources, the economic calculation problem. Um, many, many kibbutzim had problems with people taking too much food uh, and hemorrhaging wealth and money through their cafeterias um, and to the point where people the common saying was that people's dogs ate well that they would just go and oh chicken eggs I'll take these and then I'll feed them to Fido uh, and why not it's all free oh I'll just fill my plate over and over again throw the rest away I'm not paying for it who cares uh, and many many kibbutzim as a result of that uh, had to institute policies where you would be allocated a certain amount of food and you only way to get more was basically to buy it now not necessarily with cash but with your kibbutzim credits or from your account or whatever and the same problem happened when we talked about things like uh, uh, climate control in people's apartments or houses uh, people would just leave the air conditioners on all the time because it's Israel and it's hot in a lot of the places and some of these kibbutzim are in you know the Dead Sea, uh, the, the the on the coast of the Dead Sea, or in the Negev Desert, or in these areas that are honestly quite quite hot, um, and people will just say, "I'm going to leave it on all the time, even if I'm not in work. I don't want to come back from my shift and have my apartment be you know 130 degrees, so I'm going to leave the air conditioner on all day, uh, as opposed to just when I'm there or whatever else." and this had led has also led uh, many kibbutzim to abolish you know that and go to a system of credits for your uh for your climate control and on and on and on uh and the economic calculation problem is also evident in that most of these kibbutzim now are failing economically at the time of the writing of this book and i don't know if this is still the case uh but there was a, a, a massive uh, financial crisis among the kibbutzim in 1985. Um, basically, as the years went by, uh, the memberships in the various kibbutzim were always demanding more and more amenities. They wanted, uh, you know, obviously things like air conditioning and cafeterias and foods, but also they wanted, uh, you know, pools and gyms. And, and what the kibbutzim would do is if they couldn't afford that, they would just take out loans. And eventually, almost it was over 85, 90 percent of the kibbutzim became heavily, heavily in debt. But most of them, again, 85, 90 percent of them did not have a profitable uh, craft industry of any type that would justify uh, receiving these loans or make it possible for them to pay them back. Um, so maybe they have a canning factory or a, a parts factory, or maybe they have an apricot orchard or a date orchard uh, or some other kind of uh, farming uh, thing going on. And these would often be operating either at a loss or uh, just at parity, or maybe they are making some profit, but this profit would nowhere be nowhere near be enough to uh, make payments. Uh, on the interest on the loans, let alone the principal that were invoked. And so, uh, long story short, with a few exceptions, and literally literally a handful, uh, it's said repeatedly that there's about half a dozen kibbutzim that are, are solvent, 
and of that half a dozen, there's one or two that have done very, very well. There's one, I forget the name, but they own a factory that makes diamond cutting tools. And this factory makes, you know, 50, it makes in the tens of millions in profit per year, at least at the time of this book was being written. And uh, in profit, not just in revenue. And that even though it's a large kibbutzim and you split all the split as many ways as it goes, it doesn't mean that every individual member is wealthy, but that that kibbutzim is doing well. But that's an extremely exceptional one. Hardly one that you can base your analysis of the entire movement on. Uh, none of these kibbutzim were able to repay, and so the Israeli government had to step in and basically structure uh, repayment and uh, basically bail them out. <coughs> in a lot of ways, uh, 1985 kind of marked the end of the kibbutzim, and now the ones that still exist are saddled with the realization that they are now uh, stuck into debts that they can never really repay, uh, their businesses, such as they are, have never been profitable, and it looks very likely that they never will be. Um, there's always, of course, a chance that, that could change. And so many of them are transitioning away from being kibbutzim into basically just being real estate ventures that will uh, sell shares to non-members, uh, parse out the property, and basically become neighborhoods. Uh, some of them, the only way that they can... Um, stave uh, the de de dissolution is to basically uh, zone themselves into lots of little lots and and sell those uh, and there's a few of them that you know thankfully for or luckily for them are in areas with high real estate values that might be able to uh, you know pay off some of their debts or whatever most of them that's not the case though and it's hardly an indication of uh, of a social organization that uh, is uh, you know that it has merit to, def to say that it ha they were lucky enough to have good real estate i mean without a real estate market on top of that it would be pointless uh but it was hardly it, that's hardly a replicatable uh source of revenue or wealth so uh yeah they they definitely suffer and you know how much of how much is the failure uh, of their entrepreneurship because how much of that is a result of their uh, left-leaning left uh, anti-capitalist ideology? That's a good question. You know, it's not one that I think that you can you can demonstrate. Um, but you know, clearly the idea that capitalism is evil and that exchange is evil and that it's exploitative um, doesn't help you when you're trying to find marketable goods for people. A lot of them are wedded to Marxist ideas about industrial armies or agricultural armies, the idea being uh, is that the best thing for workers is to do something where they receive 100% or as close to 100% of the products of their labor as possible. This is something, one of the predictions that Marx had, one of the many predictions that he had that turned out to be wrong, that workers would be more satisfied in a, in a situation where they receive everything back that they put in. Uh, versus a situation where they only receive some fraction of that and that the and and the rest being kept by the capitalists. Now, that intuitively kind of makes sense unless you say, well, what if the this part where you only receive a fraction back is a much larger chief, right? So let's say I become a subsistence farmer uh, and I get a hundred percent of it back uh, and and you know, no, there's no capitalist taking any portion. There's no investors taking any portion or whatever. A hundred percent of all my effort goes back to me. Um, that would, you know, practically speaking, mean that I would be living off of potatoes and I'd probably starve to death. You know, I might, I might uh, become a subsistence farmer and just barely make, uh, produce enough to, during the summer anyway, eat, although it wouldn't be much of a diet. Uh, and probably die in the winter, or if I was very lucky, make make it through on starvation rations. Now, versus if I had a job and 50% went to my boss and 50% went to me, but I make enough, you know, in a day to feed myself for a week, every week, forever. Um, of course, that's comparing apples and oranges because I just compared a, a, a wage to a, a you know remuneration in kind. So let's just say. Working for myself, I could make 
a uh, hundred dollars a week and then working for someone else I can make five hundred dollars a week even though they're taking uh, who knows 75 percent of the value now according to Marx he and this is not according to like him saying that he thinks this is the ethical thing but his prediction is that well workers will feel more satisfied when they're getting a higher percentage they won't just go to where the wages are highest and that's false. They'll go to where the wages are highest. And you have to wonder about these kibbutzim people who are then looking like, look, we don't need to worry about the outside world because as long as we're all working on our on our um, date orchard uh, or whatever else, or our fish farming thing, or um, our irrigation, or in our factory, our canning factory, or whatever. I, he talked about one that uh, was the, at one point a, a large producer of gavelta fish. Um, that we'll, they'll, we'll be satisfied and we don't need to worry about uh, anything else. And that's just proved not to be correct. You, you can't just ignore the desires of other people. You know, people always accuse libertarianism and capitalism of being atomistic and individualistic. And in a certain sense, that's certainly correct. But in, an, in a very real sense, uh, the way to prosper in a free market and in an anarcho-capitalist society, certainly in a libertarian minarchist society also, is to be aware of what other people desire and to to curtail or or organize or or uh, your your life to uh, to meet those desires to say oh if people really like X uh, they they'd be willing to uh, you know compensate me if I was able to provide them X at a reasonable price um, so I'm going to do that and and then you are not only you are making money obviously but you are also uh, satisfying people's needs and desires uh, and the better you do that the more you stand to make uh, and I don't see how that is intrinsically somehow anti-human whereas I'm just gonna do my stuff and as long as I do my stuff my work that's good enough uh, fuck the rest of the world you know why and of course they don't say fuck the rest of the world but um, the, impl the implication being as long as you are getting the full products of your labor as close to that as possible then it doesn't really matter you should be happy or, or you will be happy uh, a couple, another couple uh, interesting things uh, a lot of these started to try and break down normal uh, nuclear family structures in, in lieu of collective awareness um, and if you you know, when people talk, uh, when, uh, what's his name, John Rawls, uh, you know, Theory of Justice talks about how it's, you know, we should favor a welfare state and whatnot because uh, we want to have a system that would, where you, if you don't know what, where, what your role in society is going to be. You want one that's going to treat you well, and so you want a, uh, you know, a welfare for poor people or whatever. Um, and that it's not fair that uh, taxation of, of wealthy people is justified because it's not fair. You know, there there's deterministic reasons that people achieve wealth, which is, you know, understandable uh, claim to make. Um, and so they don't deserve it in, in any real sense. Um, but... You know, we can talk about education and we can talk about job experience and we can talk about that. But the probably the biggest thing other than genetics uh, is your family. You know, uh, everyone has different families. And uh, if you have a family that uh, gives you a proper upbringing, then your potential, your skill sets, your uh, ability to socialize and to interact and be productive is greatly enhanced relative to what it could what could happen. Uh, and Rawls uh, shied away from saying, well, maybe we should abolish the family and have children brought up, you know, uh, by the state, basically. He, I don't know if he shied away from that because he, or, and it wouldn't just be him, it would be many people, right? We have all these people who say, well, affirmative action in school, uh, affirmative action in the workplace, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, why not, uh, you know, that those are all secondary or tertiary considerations when we talk about the outcomes people have. Now, the primary things, again, aside from genetics, it's going to be like their family, their upbringing. Uh, and 
you know, whether, whether they have parents who read to them or talk to them or don't beat them or do beat them or uh, provide them with enough sustenance that they get the full development or lack of full development or uh, intellectual stimulation or distimulation or whatever else. Uh, and you know, do they shy away because they just realize that that would be a very hard sell and probably prompt a uh, counter reaction that would destroy them? Uh, which is possible, or do they just have uh, intuition that that's actually f bad? That there's actually something valuable in a nuclear parent, two parents, one possible uh, household, and that uh, there is no alternative to that that is superior in any general sense. Uh, obviously, you can have individual cases where results may vary. You can have single parents or even you know orphaned children who do quite well uh, but I don't think anyone can point to the, such exceptional cases and say yeah in, in general um, and you know in the case of Rawls or anyone else I don't know uh, I think it's probably a combination of both but you have with the kibbutzim uh, what they started to do uh, it began apparently by accident but the children instead of living with their parents they would actually live in a children's dorm so to speak, uh, and be raised by uh, kibbutzim staff. They'd be going to kibbutzim school, and there'd be like a, a kibbutzim nursery. And the parents, you know, they'd work in the factory or the fields, and then uh, very briefly they would uh, see the children for a few minutes. Uh, it was even among some discouraged for them to sit together uh, at dinner. They had cafeterias. And if you went and sat by your parents or they sat by you, that was considered wrong. And there were some that even got to the point where if the parents came to a group of children that included their own children, that they would greet their children last. That they would go, oh, hi, blah, blah, blah. And then their children last to show how egalitarian they were and how non-family uh, oriented they were. And of course, I mean, just to, that sounds traumatic and terrible. And this tendency, this this push receded because you had a lot of parents who hated it. Uh, and the, the book is full of uh, especially mothers, but fathers, too, who are like, I want my children in my house. I want and, you know, it, it's not purely. I mean, it's it's mostly an emotional thing, but it's not only that. You know, they would like look. You know, if my I I don't trust the you know the the kibbutzim appointed nanny to jump on any issue as quickly as I'm going to do. You know, it, it's too important to be left in the hands of somebody else. This is something that we need to control. And so, by the '70s, you had the 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 practice of children uh being left uh in these uh communal uh living arrangements fading away to people going back to their place and this was this is a very common theme of more and more autonomy being granted more and more autonomy being granted and why because people want more and more autonomy people don't like living in a barracks all the time they don't like having to shower together all the time they don't like having to eat together all the time and even even the the presence of the cafeterias has waned quite a bit where more people feel, I just want to cook at home and you know and why not with the idea that like everyone should have scrambled eggs you know if, on one day on Monday and bagels on Tuesday uh, and gefilte fish on Wednesday well what if somebody wants doesn't like those things you know the idea that one size fits all uh, you know, at least within, even within the relatives, you know, these kibbutzim might have 100, 200, sometimes 500. I think the largest have 1,000 or maybe a little bit more, but typically less than that. You know, that idea is really anathema to real world experience. You know, and, and it, there also were other, you know, these are issues that the reaction is negative, and you wonder if that's just uh, from you know, uh, some of people's intuition that it's wrong or because it actually, you know, smarts. But like we, ha you would have cases where you couldn't, I mean, you would say, oh, I want to have like a toaster. I want a toaster. And you couldn't get one. You'd have to apply 
and the board would have to look and the board would have to look and they'd go through so many committees and they would say no you don't need a toaster from each according to his ability to each according to his need you don't need a toaster but then they would approve somebody else to take a trip you know a three-month uh, vacation to go to a conference uh, you know in South Africa or the US or California or whatever else um, and the committees would just oh well they need this so they we will expend the, the kibitzim will flip the bill you know no matter how high for one person to indulge in their self-actualization and then another they'll say no you don't get anything and of course many times i think this would almost certainly be the result of political intrigue and you know the petty arguments between uh you know socially complex animal like humans but on the other hand it it, it may not it likely wasn't always that case it was all likely just well we're we're looking we have our ethics and our uh political philosophy and you know objectively based on those you don't need the thing that you're asking for now you say you need it and you say you want it and you're asking but you know we've decided that you don't and you are denied the autonomy to you know, and many of these kibbutzim did not allow members to have money um even if you inherited like it was not uncommon for them to inherit money from relatives or after world war ii many of them received payments from the uh BDR, from the west german government and and these would inevitably have to be given to the kibbutz you were not allowed to uh, keep them yourself or if you did then that would cause a great deal of acrimony to the point of you could be kicked out um so you see that that level of submitting your life and again i remember many times in debates being like well what about you know you say that the you know everything should be owned by the, the commune and, and so isn't that annoying you know the, you only need to pick your clothes and this no no of course you'd have freedom to own your clothes and freedom and many of these kibbutz no you don't own your clothes the kibbutz owns their clothes and 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 they issue you know so many uh and cer certain types and that's it and you don't and you don't get to say i want to have more i think i feel good in a kawaiian shirt or sunglasses or whatever else i mean you can always ask there's a democratic uh, bureaucratic process that you can submit your uh, request to but it's only a request you know you have to ask uh, you can't tell you don't have the autonomy to assert yourself and people find that grating people don't enjoy that um, and one of the big problems that this book outlines is that uh, the retention of young people uh, you know so children who grow up in the kibbutz and all the kibbutzim have very strong uh, commitments to uh, sustaining the children of the kibbutz. Uh, the retention is less than forty percent. You know, as soon as they turn, as soon as they join the military, which in Israel they have to join the military, most of them are gone. They never come back. Uh, and it's interesting to show, despite the fact of all the indoctrination that's going on, and many of them talk about creating a new socialist man. You know, we haven't heard this phrase before, the new socialist man. Well, here you have kids who are growing up in a commune. The education system is completely run by the commune and they don't become the new socialist man and it was a recurrent theme that these kids growing up they didn't have the ideological fervor they didn't really care that much about from each according to his ability to each according to his need these were things that they might be platitudes that they might mimic or voice or or express express sympathy to but they didn't feel any over overwhelming zeal to achieve uh, and this was a very real problem, you know, because if you don't have the Napoleons of the animal farm, then it just doesn't work. You need the people who are going to throw themselves into it uh, for ideological reasons, independent of material compensation, to kind of carry the weight of all the people who are going to be lazy. Uh, and and it's not just you know be lazy and do the work. It's live. It's to put up with the decidedly anti-human anti-autonomy uh, uh, microculture that's that's developed you need people who are going to uh motivate everyone to just keep go, you know keep going keep going it's this is a good thing this is a good thing and uh 
good people become, and this is another thing they said, good people become rarer and rarer and rarer. If anyone, if any of those kids growing up there has any, any ambition, and it doesn't even be, oh, I want to be, uh, you know, a, a millionaire. It's like, like, I want to be a poet or I want to, uh, you know, uh, get married and have a family, and have my own place and, you know, go to the beach or go to school, you know, which the kibbutzim would sometimes allow people to go to school and even subsidize it. But any any ambition for something that was outside the ability of the kibbutzim to provide, which is a very, very wide range of things, right? It's a very narrow goal. The, the goal that it completely matches with the life of the kibbutzim or the commune offers is a very narrow one. And to assume that many people would have that is an outlandish assumption and indeed a false one most of the time. And so the, the people would leave. And the few who would come back, the few who would stay, would be those who are intimidated by the outside world and who feel like they can't really succeed in it, who, who don't have anything to lose. Their alternative to the kibbutzim is, in their minds anyway, failure on the outside. Uh, and so you, okay, that we feel very nice. We're going to help this person who feels so low about their self-esteem that they can't make it in the real world. But you're going to have a whole whole commune that's basically full of people like that and not people who are actually innovative and hardworking uh, and, and high-functioning. And that's what you've seen. You've seen a devolution, uh, a, a crippling of the human capital, the human potential of these because the rest of the world just offers so much more. Um, now, again, people could say, well, what if everyone was, a, you know, everywhere was a communal, there would be no place for them to go, uh, right? They would be stifled then wherever they go. So, uh, you know, the book doesn't, it, it, it says that kibbutzim are going to have to change. That's a process that's already begun. Uh, that they're becoming considerably more uh, like a homeowners association or something like that than, a complete little island of anarcho-syndicalist utopia, as if it was ever that. Um, that the only way it even gets off the ground is if you have a, a cadre of highly ideologically motivated um, uh, revolutionaries, basically. Uh, and even then it's quite difficult and raises all kinds of problems with the economic calculation problem and the incentive problem. And what's interesting is that that socialist dogma has a very hard time reaching the next generation. And I think one thing I thought about when I was reading this book is like certain certain ideologies seem more able to be passed on from generation to generations, like religions. You know, the Abrahamic religions, whatever you want to say about them, they have a decent ability to be passed on to the next generation, to be inculcate their culture and their values, whether it's Islam or Judaism or Christianity. And the Marxism, the socialism uh, of the kibbutzim doesn't translate as well. It's not to say it never happens. There certainly are people who grow up in it and are, have affinity to it and join. It's just very, very small. Uh, and, and there's also, even among that group, there's considerably less, um, you know, uh, vim and verve and and uh, and devotion to the ideas and the original revolutionaries. And of course, you also have the thing of of upbringing. You have these people who might have been, you know, persecuted or in military services in Eastern Europe or secret, uh, uh, you know, who knows, even uh, secret services in Eastern Europe in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Russian Empire. Uh, who had a lot of experiences under their belt and they come here and they start a society and then their kids grow up and, you know, the worst that they have to do, deal with is, well, maybe an Arab uprising here and there. But besides that, you know, uh, canning, getting cut on the canning supplies or whatever. So, yeah, uh, definitely an interesting kind of study of, of this niche society. Uh, one that's referenced a lot. You know, I feel much better able to talk about it, you know, if and when this subject ever gets brought up again. Um, 
again, I think that people should be free to join these if they want. I think that it's perfectly legitimate for people to voluntarily get together and form a, a kibbutzim like this, but I don't see that it's particularly uh, appealing way of life for the vast majority of people. Um, it's not a particularly wealthy or materialistic way of life for the vast majority of people. Uh, and not only that, but like the the systematic crushing, if not complete destruction of autonomy, is something that most people are not okay with, that they don't agree with. Um, and these are features that are explicitly part of this society, right? So this isn't you could this isn't one of the criticisms you could say, well, well, and this is circumstances of Israel, you know, and and. and today or the last 60 or 70 years you know it's autonomy crushing but in a real in the in the worldwide anarcho-syndicalism that wouldn't be the case no it's 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 in there in the ideology it's part of look you don't just get to everything is communally controlled you don't just get to take whatever resources you want you have to work as hard as they want you to uh, and they'll give you what they decide, and you should be happy with that. And the fact is that well, the vast majority of people aren't. So anyway, I think this is plenty long for this topic. So I will talk to you all another time. Bye-bye.